Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same Holy Spirit to be wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, Thursday, March 4, 2021. The Gospel of today's Mass comes from St. Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. It's a long gospel. It narrates the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man. Okay, so it's long, but uh, I think it's worth going through the whole story. So let's read it. Jesus said to the Pharisees, there was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and dined sumptuously each day. And lying at his door outside the door of his house, I suppose, was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's stable. So he must be homeless, a vagrant, moving about, and uh, spent uh, his days just camping out there on the, uh, by the steps of the uh, rich man's door. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, Lazarus died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. In other words, he went to heaven, right? The rich man also died and was buried. And from the netherworld, where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. So imagine the scene. This rich man went to hell, okay? and as he was looking up into the heavens, he saw Abraham and Lazarus, okay? and he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering torment in these flames. Here we already have an early image of what hell is. <laughs> How hell is like going to be a place of flames, right? Abraham said, my child, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are tormented. Moreover, between us and you, a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing. Right? There's no way Lazarus would even do that. Dip his finger in water and give it to the rich man because there was a big gulf separating them. Who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours? Then cannot do that. He said, the rich man said to Abraham then, Then I beg you, Father, Send him to my father's house. Send Lazarus, please, to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, okay, may warn my brothers not to repeat my mistakes of not caring for my neighbors like Lazarus, so that they may be spared this torment that I am now suffering lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. So Abraham was saying, You know, your brothers, if they're using their heads, and if they're faithful, okay, they already have Moses and the prophets. What do Moses and the prophets signify? The law. Right? Moses was the lawgiver. Okay? The prophets are the ones who spoke about the coming of Jesus, forewarned them. Okay? The kingdom of God will be coming. So, um, so um, um, Father Abraham was telling 
this rich man, you know what? If your brothers are only listening, okay, they already have Moses and the prophets. Okay, they are already the ones who are supposed to warn them, talk to them, tell them about the law of God. And if only they are not proud, okay, and disobedient, then Moses and the prophets would have been sufficient. They are the ones with the authority to instruct your brothers. But this rich man still reasoned out. Oh, he said, uh, no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to warn them, they will repent. <laughs> and Father Abraham said, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. Very true. Very true, right? If your brothers will not listen to the authority of the very people that I had already put with them, beside them, to guide them in this life, then even if somebody comes back from the dead, your brothers are not going to listen. They won't. Why? Because they're too proud to recognize their own mistakes. Okay? They are too proud to listen to the authority of the people I have put right beside them. They refuse to acknowledge the whole mechanism that I have arranged for them, which is there are your guides, there are your rules, here is the authority you need to obey. You need to follow. But they refuse to do that. Why? Because they are proud. So the biggest sin, really, of these rich people describing the gospel here, both this man who died and his brothers, okay, is not so much that they did not care. The lack of caring for their poor neighbors is only a consequence of the fact that they are full of pride, too proud to even heed what Moses and the prophets might have been teaching them for the longest time. If they will not listen to legitimate authority, to the people God has put right there with them to guide them in their lives, to reveal to them the obvious truths that they are supposed to believe in. Okay? If they refuse to acknowledge the clear teaching that God has already put forth for them to understand, they will not be persuaded by anything else. Even if somebody came from the dead and told them, there is hell, you better repent not going to work okay and what's the culprit pride 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 makes us rebellious that's one of the first effects of being proud it makes us rebellious it makes us rebel against truth number one the truth about ourselves the truth about our shortcomings the truth about the wrong things we do, we don't see that because pride clouds our intellect and our will and our conscience. Pride removes the ability for us to see through with sincerity to ourselves and recognize our faults. And instead, what pride makes us do is to rebel against authority. Oh, rebel against your parents. Rebel against, uh, against uh, your priests. Rebel against anybody who is trying to tell you what's wrong with you. The first thing we do is to rebel when we are proud. See? And that is why nothing would sink. Nothing would sink. And therefore, we don't learn our lesson. Okay? We don't learn our lesson. 
because we bar immediately bar anything, any authority to come through to us in order to make us understand the truth. See? We become numb, we become dense, we become deaf. God bless you. To the truth about ourselves. And we cannot find in us the, 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 uh, the prompting to obey and to trust the authority that God has put beside us to guide our lives. And you know what? Pride is a very difficult vice to get rid of. That's why it's at the head and the root of all sin. See? That's the reason why pride is the root of all sin. Every sin you commit, there is always, it's always traceable back to pride. Pride is one very, very difficult vice to overcome. And there is really no uh, quick solution to it. God bless you. <laughs> There's really no quick solution. There's no quick fix. Okay? The other virtues are a lot easier to, to, uh, to learn and to put into practice. But pride, pride is a very, very difficult uh, um, virtue to... What's that? Huh? Sorry, vice. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. I get carried away. Uh, pride is a very difficult vice to overcome. And of course, the opposite of pride is humility. So humility is very difficult to acquire. But there is one, if you might call it a quick fix, there is one way to facilitate humility and to overcome pride. What is that? It's another virtue that really, really becomes the training ground, so to speak. For you to acquire humility and get rid of pride. That other virtue is obedience. Obedience. Obedience, obedience, obedience. Just as like what our Lord is telling this rich man. If they only, if they only listen. If your brothers only listen to Moses and the prophets. The listening part there really means obeying. It's not just uh, hearing what is said from Moses and the prophets. It's actually obeying what Moses and the prophets have laid out for them. Okay? So obedience is key to getting rid of pride or overcoming it along the way. That is why parents, especially here in our own household, right? What has been our rule? Even in homeschooling, that was the first thing that I taught you, right? If you recall, from the first time you opened your first books or you learned your ABCs and you started counting, the first lesson I've always taught you and I've always repeated this to you, the first lesson in school is obedience. It's not your ABCs. It's not your one, two, threes. It's Obey, obey, obey. And there's a reason for that. It's because of this. It's because of pride. It's because you need to learn to obey from the first moments of your lives. Because if you don't learn to obey, you will be proud all your life. You're going to be miserable with your pride all your life. If you do not learn to obey, look at the problem of this rich man. Right? It was a problem of pride rooted in disobedience. And look where he ended up. He may have all the luxuries in life. He would have enjoyed everything in his pride. He would, you know, be puffed up with his own perfections, with his own wealth. Oh, I'm a self-made man. Right? Well, where did that all lead him? Let's not forget what our Lord said, right? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet lose his own soul? Okay? 
Obedience, obedience, obedience. And do you know what? This matter of obedience is as old as Genesis, as old as creation. Okay? What was the first sin all about? Okay? When our Lord told Adam and Eve, okay, you can have everything in the garden except that tree in the middle of the garden. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. What was our Lord testing? Was he testing whether they were going to obey or whatnot? You know? The real test in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, that's why they were told not to eat of that fruit. The real test there was not so much uh, whether our, uh, you know, <laughs> whether, uh, well, whatever. <laughs> what am I saying? The real test there is God is testing whether Adam and Eve would trust him would trust God. It was a test of trust. And the way that he tested it was by making them obey. One simple command. You can eat everything except for that fruit. So the way our Lord tested their trust was to give them a command to obey. Right? Because it's harder to conquer their pride. Oh, you know, I'm going to know good and evil. Wow. So, you know, then that means I'm going to be very smart. That means I know everything. That means I don't need God to tell me what's good and bad because I will know it myself. I will be the judge of my own actions. There's no such thing as me depending on a moral authority to tell me what's good or bad. You see? I don't have to be dependent on the authority of God. I don't even have to be dependent on the providence of God who will provide me everything I need because, hey, it's all here in this garden. He already gave it to me. Therefore, I have no need for God any longer. I am self-sufficient. I am a self-made man. <laughs> in his pride, Adam forgot that he was just a creature. That he had nothing. And that whatever it is he had was given to him in trust. That later on he was going to use all of this to glorify God. But he didn't. He was overcome by pride. Okay? By pride. And he asserted himself. Rather than giving his trust to God, who ultimately is the authority who created him. Okay? So, but how was he tested? By way of obedience. That is why obedience is the pathway to overcoming pride. Well, at least one of the many ways, but it is a great, great, big highway if you will, that leads to humility. Obedience, obedience, obedience. Obey. Obey, obey, obey. <laughs> and you know what, folks, those of you who are listening to us here, everybody has a reason to obey someone. We, we are always under the authority, moral, spiritual, human, authority of people who have our best interest in mind. See? It can be a parent. It can be a spouse. It can be a father. It can be a mother-in-law. It can be a, a, a benevolent government who really cares for you. It can be your priest, your spiritual director. Everybody in this world has some authority that he needs to obey if he knows what's good for his own soul. Everybody, everybody who is humble enough to acknowledge that he doesn't have everything he needs to attain sanctity in this world. He, in humility, recognizes that he 
needs to obey some authority. So I'd like you children to understand that, to realize that. So when we had that kindergarten rule and that little mantra that we used to recite and we still recite, what is the first lesson in school? And you used to answering chorus, obey. <laughs> that is valid, very valid, before, now, and forever. Whether you were two years old, five years old, beginning kindergarten, or 18 years old, when you think you have a little bit of liberty now to do a few things on your own, which of course you do, because we, your parents, trust you enough to do the right thing, right? But let me remind you, if you start fooling around and giving bad example, and you take liberties that you know very well you were not supposed to take, and your other younger siblings see that, you know what you're doing? Not only have you disobeyed by taking liberties that you know very well you were not supposed to, but you're also giving bad example to your younger siblings. And when you do that, you're confusing your younger siblings because they're now going to ask, wait a minute, I thought we're not supposed to do this. We're supposed to ask permission for doing that. But well, how come my older sister can do that? How come my older brother can do that? See? The truth of the matter is no, you can. the older brother cannot do that. No, the older sister cannot do that. But they have taken certain liberties because they think they know better now. They think they can control themselves now. They think they're old enough to be able to make those decisions now. Well, really? <laughs> Ava asks, really? Well, Ava, the answer is no. No. Rules are rules, and they will remain to be the rules of the house okay? until those rules are changed or relaxed. Okay? And the older ones among you precisely have a greater responsibility to obey the rules so that the younger ones will follow suit. Otherwise, you're giving bad example to the younger ones. Okay? And that is not good at all. So obedience knows no limits, obedience knows no age, obedience knows no boundaries. You obey all the time. As we all do, we all have to obey. One way or another, we have to obey certain people in authority who have our best interest at heart. So this Lent, it's a very good time to practice obedience with more intensity, with more intensity. And let's, let's not forget that Jesus Christ overcame the disobedience of Adam in the garden with his own obedience to his Father's will up to the point of dying on the cross, suffering death in obedience to what his Father had willed for him. Remember the agony in the garden where our Lord was practically begging God the Father, please, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. I am in agony. I am suffering already just thinking about what I'm going through, all of this crucifixion, all of the scourging, the crowning with thorns, the carrying of this heavy burden of the cross. To culminate in the piercing of my own hands and feet and my side. Please, Father, if it is your will. See, that's the condition. If it is your will, let this cup pass from me. But it is not my will, but yours be done. See the obedience of our Lord there? Somehow we can call the, that uh, uh, an internal rebellion, maybe an internal struggle. I don't want to, his humanity was already suffering 
just imagining what he was going through, right? That is the humanity of our Lord expressed in the agony in the garden. When he was suffering, just thinking about his suffering. In fact, he sweat blood. That's how intense it was for our Lord. Yet, what does he say in the end? Not my will, Father, not my will, but yours. Be done. Beautiful example of obedience that our Lord has given us at the agony in the garden and all throughout his death and crucifixion. Let's be reminded of that this Lent that hopefully we'll learn to practice the virtue of obedience very well. Okay, that's it for us, folks. Eva, shall we say goodbye? No, she's now feeding her baby. Okay, well, let's go, everybody. Have a good day. Hope to see you again tomorrow. Bye.